when troubles come and my heart burden me, then I am still and waiting in the silence until you come and see. Welcome us to this auspicious program in celebration of our cultural heritage, our Africa Day celebration. Welcome to the University of Limpopo's Africa Day celebration. We are going to be celebrating our fauna and flora, our cultural diversity that makes us stronger, that which makes us Africans be it in the North African regions, be it in Ghana, be it in Nigeria, be it in Algeria or Egypt, be it in our neighboring uh, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Swaziland. This is Africa, this is who we are. And in our spirit of our unique Ubuntu, we welcome you all to our Africa Day celebration. This is the Africa Day celebration hosted by the University of Limpopo. And that was the opening, you raised me up. We, we hope that today you will be raised up in spirits, in African spirits, as we celebrate our culture and heritage. And as we, to kick off our program today, we will welcome the DVC in research and uh, development, um, Professor Jessica Singh, to introduce to us our guest of honor. But we will be having in the midst of our celebration um, renditions from UL choristers distant from where they are in the pandemic era where we are facing 
regulations that allow us to perform in rather unconventional ways. We celebrate African heritage even in those times. Welcome to the Africa's Day celebration of the University of Limpopo. Enjoy. Give it all to Africa. Need the pension. They are host of we. Beautiful rendition by Bongi Kumalo, reminding us of the times when John Knox Bokwe was in, our, in exile in Scotland and he writes as a Methodist pastor, God bless Africa and her sons and daughters. God unite Africa in those difficult moments. He reminds everyone that we are connected together in one spirit that God should bless because we are of one being in one continent of Africa. This should uh, then lead us to the introductions by Professor Jessica Singh, our DVC, the Deputy Vice Chancellor in uh, Research and Development, to welcome us and to introduce us to the guest speaker of today, Professor Singh. Good morning, Africa. Good morning, University of Lumpopo, and all those of you who are joining us today. A very warm, beautiful autumn day in Lumpopo at the University of Lumpopo as we welcome you to our Africa Day celebrations. Annually, we celebrate this beautiful day of being African, of being on this beautiful continent. And this morning, I'm going to speak to you a little bit about how we celebrate at UL before I introduce our um, keynote speaker for you today. Um, I would love to talk to you about building on the beautiful, building on the beautiful Africa. And as the program director has mentioned, what is it about Africa that makes us unique? Why is it that other continents do not celebrate this uniqueness that we have? It is because we, as an African continent, we celebrate as a whole continent with every uh, country on this continent, we celebrate about being uniquely African. And having our own identity, having this African culture that we can all across the co continent together celebrate, as was mentioned, whether it's in North Africa, whether it's in East Africa, whether it's in West Africa, whether it's in Central Africa, where it's, whether it's on the beautiful southern tip of Africa with our beautiful coastlines where we find ourselves, we celebrate our being uniquely African, being uniquely um, uh, different in the way in which we come together as a people, as a continent. Another aspect of Africa that we celebrate uh, despite this huge continent with many, many languages, 
we celebrate African languages today. We celebrate African cuisine, the lovely, delicious meals that we enjoy as people on this continent. We celebrate African dress with its uh, vibrant, beautiful colors. We, we also know that as a continent, we are unique in that we have a potential for attracting the rest of the world. And we do this, I'm sure you've heard in the news in the last day or two, the, um, you've heard of our Makoti blankets that are selling, uh, made in mohair wool, that are selling online for between 10 and 15,000 rands for a blanket, a unique African uh, uh, print, which is your stripes with your, your lovely tassels at the end. These are the things that make us unique as a country. The, the, the contributions that we make, whether it's with our dress, with the, whether it's with the products that we, we, we produce. Uh, you've just heard our students sing. The unique, the symbolism of the African drum, the symbolism of the calabash. These are the things we celebrate about Africa. Uh, it's not only our people that we celebrate today on Africa Day. It's this beautiful continent the wildlife that we have that we won't find anywhere else in the world. Across the continent, we celebrate the beautiful wildlife, the natural beauty of our, our rocks and our mountains, our coastlines. Uh, we can also, can we, as, 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 as a continent, as South Africa, can we even possibly speak so many, in, uh, so many different indigenous languages can we all wear different clothes? We eat different foods. Can we still be one? Yes. As an African continent, we can still be one. Why? This is why, because we share the values, the morals, the principles that the rest of the world finds enviable. A binding principle of Africa is a concept of Ubuntu. This togetherness that we feel and it's just not a feeling. It's us all making it happen. And we here at the University of Africa, uh, of Limpopo, also make this happen. And we also have the realization that as Africans, we are united in who we are. Our identity, identity is, is one of unity. Now, at the University of Limpopo, we subscribe to these African beliefs and principles. And every year we celebrate, we in, endeavor to incorporate this into our branding of the university, into our events, into our publications, and also into our curriculum. But I just want to also caution us that in building the beautiful Africa that we all are so proud of, beware of our number one enemy, corruption and greed. This leads to poverty, inequality, and oppression. As the University of Limpopo, uh, amidst the global pandemic of COVID-19 that we find ourselves in, what we want to do today is to pause and celebrate our beautiful continent. And we, also, we are also proud of the African academics that put our continent on the map. So this morning, it is my pleasure to introduce a son of the soil who is going to deliver our Africa Day keynote address, Prof. Winston Ngomalo. I'm going to read out a brief bio of uh, Prof. Ngomalo before he comes up. Winston Ngomalo obtained his PhD from the University of Witwatersrand in 2011. He did his postdoc at GSK in Spain and Itemba Pharmaceuticals from March 2011 April 2012, working on developing new drugs to treat TB. He joined the University of Limpopo as a senior lecturer in May of 2012 and was promoted to associate professor in 2017. Prof's research interests are in medical chemistry, focusing on synthesis of heterocyclic compounds and isolation of bioactive compounds from medicinal plants which are tested for activity against various diseases such as TB, malaria, and cancer. His research also focuses on method optimization for extraction of bioactive compounds and their formulation, 
Uh, Prof has supervised and graduated a PhD student, 10 master students, and 12 honors students. Uh, and he has published as well over 20 articles in peer-reviewed journals since joining the University of Limpopo. His research group has raised over 10 million rands in research funding, and he has established collaborations together with his group with a number of research groups in South Africa, in China, and in the USA. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome Prof. Winston Malo, who is going to be our keynote address, present the keynote address on Africa Day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Singh, our GVC uh, Program Director, Prof. Matsiba Tlela. Uh, thank you to our colleagues who have joined, our students who have joined, and also our guests. Uh, thank you for taking time uh, to participate in this event, and I feel very humbled and honored to be invited to deliver this uh, keynote lecture. Uh, so, uh, when I first received the invitation, I was a bit uh, uh, shocked as to why was I considered. And uh, looking at the topic as a whole, uh, Africa Day celebration and then traditional medicines and COVID, those are broad fields which one is not an expert in either of them. Uh, so it was a bit of a, of a challenge to, 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 to summarize my talk. Uh, given the allocated time. Uh, but I'll be speaking uh, a little bit as an African, uh, but mainly uh, coming from the academic perspective in terms of uh, as academics, uh, where are we in, as South Africans, uh, South African researchers, where are we as South Africa as a whole, and uh, what can be improved uh, to make sure that we keep on celebrating our heritage and our culture, uh, obviously, main focus being on uh, African traditional medicines. Uh, we'll try to put it in the context of COVID-19, but uh, I think what I'm, I'm about to talk about, what I'm about to say, I think uh, it covers pretty much everything that we, we're facing as a country. So, so like I said, uh, I, I did do some bit of a research. Uh, I'm not an expert in, in either COVID-19 or in either African traditional medicines or uh, being African, uh, so I try to incorporate all of them uh, by trying to get a little bit of research and background. Uh, and I hope you will find the, uh, my, my my perspective uh, to be uh, interesting and also maybe thought provoking. Uh, but by no means, please don't take it as a gospel truth because uh, everyone uh, has their own opinion and. And that's what we need uh, as Africans to also uh, stimulate each other's uh, thoughts and also try to build one another. Uh, so I will say, when we talk about African traditional medicines, uh, how, what are we actually talking about uh, with respect to your uh, Western medicines, if one may put it that way. So the Western medicines would be things that you go to the pharmacy and you will uh, buy uh, or get a prescription from a doctor. Uh, and then when, when you talk about African traditional medicines, what are we talking about? Uh, so it's one of those things which are very uh, hard to define and, and, and broadly define because when you look at some of the Western medicines that we have, uh, they are plant-derived uh, medicines which were first uh, isolated from compounds that were first isolated from plants and then they were tested against a number of diseases and then uh, people optimize them either through synthetic methods and or through uh, large extraction, which eventually led them to go to the shelf. But we like to tend to call, uh, refer to them as being Western medicines, even though they are actually uh, derived from traditional uh, medicines and obviously natural products. So traditional medicines, uh, without really putting African, because traditional medicines can be found everywhere, uh, the location will just be obviously what defines them. When you say African traditional medicines, we normally refer to what we normally use in Africa, but Chinese will also have their own traditional medicines, uh, but this is basically making use of indigenous knowledge systems where uh, 
the knowledge is being passed on from generation to generation uh, through observations. Uh, it's very key that we also emphasize that, that it was through observations where uh, people observed the effectiveness of uh, certain plants or certain uh, concoctions uh, for the treatment of certain plants. Uh, so it's not something that it's, uh, people just woke up one day and then I had a dream. Uh, they, they tried and tested them. If you go back to uh, the age of civilization, going back 5,000, 6,000 years ago, people were always sick uh, and people were always treated. So back then, obviously, there were no pills, there were no um, uh, I think, uh, cough mixtures, but it was herbs that were used. And that's what we mean by traditional medicines. It's something that has been with us for a very, very long time. It's only up until the past 200 years or so where people have started to formalize it uh, by getting more research and more scientific work around it, which was mainly pioneered by the Western uh, countries, your European countries and your American countries. Hence, we have the term now Western medicines. But even them, when they, start, when they started producing their medicines, it was mainly uh, inspired by plants. Even today, some of the research that is being done by those big pharmaceutical companies is still being in, uh, in, uh, inspired and and uh, they always go to uh, plant sources and marine sources for, for, for inspiration to look for new compounds, to look for new bioactive compounds that can be used to treat a number of diseases. So I think it's very important that when we uh, compare our traditional medicines versus Western medicines, we normally referring to one and the same thing. It's just that the level of, uh, of, prepared, of preparations and also the research that goes into one product differs from one, one, uh, one another. So it's very important to acknowledge that the knowledge that our forefathers have had for the past 50 years, for the past 100 years, for the past 10,000 years, for as long as human beings have been, uh, in, have been alive, it's, it's, it's something that we should cherish. And especially as Africans, we have a lot of uh, traditional health practitioners. We have a lot of herbalists. We have a lot of people that have indigenous knowledge on the uh, use of medicinal plants for the treatment of a number of diseases. So we should never uh, shy away of embracing them and also of uh, consulting them if we need help. Uh, we cut ourselves in the process of, uh, in an unfortunate situation where pandemic hit us uh, last year, or COVID came, and then a lot of people unfortunately got infected and unfortunately a number of them also passed away. And we were in a situation where we did not know uh, how to treat this, how to uh, avoid uh, getting uh, infected. And also, once you get infected, how then do you make sure that you, you recover? And there was a big gap. Uh, there's still a big uh, gap involved. Even with the Western medicines, uh, we still don't know anything in terms of what is the best way of treating the, uh, the, 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 the disease. What is the best way of managing the disease once you have it? What is the best way of uh, recovering from the disease within a, a short space of time? And that's where I think we, we were a bit uh, exposed and we found wanting uh, uh, as a country uh, because we did not have anything in our arsenal to say, can we try this? We did not have anything in our arsenal to say, uh, let's use this uh, method for treatment. We had to wait for people from America or Europe to give us a guidelines of, oh, if someone has this kind of disease, this is how you treat them, this is how you should uh, administer uh, the certain drugs. And now uh, almost everyone is talking about the vaccine route. Uh, but obviously not everyone has been vaccinated and we are slowly approaching our third wave. So it means a lot of us are still gonna get infected. And obviously once you get infected, the question is what is the best way of treating this uh, uh, this uh, infection or this disease. So we, we still don't know. Uh, and that's a big challenge where we, as South Africans or as Africans, we have not done enough, I think, from my uh, opinion, uh, to document all the medicinal plants that we have that are useful in terms of treating respiratory diseases. Uh, that's the first uh, uh, shortfall, which I, I think we, we, we're lacking as Africans and something that we need to think about it strongly uh, to prevent future events like this or future crises uh, like we've encountered now where 
uh, we do not have enough information available. So obviously last uh, year there was Mshonyana or Lingana that uh, people were speaking about and then uh, some countries adopted it, they ran away with it and then uh, Madagascar I think was one of them, Tanzania was another country that was uh, highly vocal about it. In South Africa we tended to be cautious where we said we wanted to do more scientific work. But again, it was one or two plans that were being spoken about. And I, I like to believe there's more plants, there's more knowledge known about plants all over the country by different traditional healers, by different uh, traditional uh, health practitioners and their associations, which could have been well documented. And then obviously, had there been a good communication between us and maybe the health uh, departments and also the scientists, and more work could have been done to uh, put those uh, into the table where we could actually try and see if will this work better for us as Africans because us as Africans uh, maybe we we need uh, our helps uh, to to respond better so those are things that I feel that we we also a bit lacking and uh, something that uh, we should uh, as Africans try to see how best can we resolve this how best can we come up with better strategies to be better prepared should something like this happen uh, in, in, in the near future. Again, uh, the behavior, uh, our behavior has changed recently, let's say over the past uh, 50, 50, 60 years. Uh, past 50, 60 years when the use of traditional medicines was very strong uh, within the country or within the African continent, uh, majority of us were, of our parents, not us because we were not born, but majority of our parents and our community members were living healthy lifestyles, were living uh, off the ground, relying on a lot of uh, agricultural products, they were exercising, uh, they were very active, and obviously the immune system was quite strong. So even if diseases came, uh, they know that if I drink one or two of these herbs, I'll get better quicker. Uh, but now our lifestyles have changed. Uh, most of uh, the country has been urbanized, so obviously by being urbanized, then you we rely a lot on fast food, we rely a lot on uh, takeaways, we don't exercise a lot, we almost drive almost everywhere we go. So that also, that behavioral aspect, does also change our, our, thing, our lifestyle. So obviously once your body gets too many toxins around it, and then you want to use the same medicinal herbs that were used by other traditional healers or other uh, 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 people, you might find that the effect might not be the same. And that can also then give a bad perception that our traditional medicines are not as effective as uh, the, uh, the Western counterparts, for instance. So it's also another thing that as Africans, we, when you embrace our culture, when you embrace our medicines, when you embrace our, our heritage, we should also make sure that we, we embrace it holistically and completely. So if I'm drinking every day, and then I expect that I won't get uh, infected, or if I drink a particular herb, I'll get sick without worrying about what effects the alcohol is putting into my system, or what effects is the, all these uh, fatty things that I eat from takeaways are putting into my system. Obviously, then there's a, uh, there's a, there's a challenge that also needs to be addressed. So it's one of those things that we also need to uh, look into our, 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 our behavior aspects that when we say traditional medicines are working or are no longer working, what are we basing it on? Uh, are we just taking the traditional medicines only without uh, looking at all the other factors affecting our lifestyle, our diet, our behavioral uh, uh, lifestyle, our, our, do we exercise a lot and all other stuff, are we stressed? All of those things do also contribute because one thing uh, we must also remember and always remember is that the body is the one that heals itself. Uh, the body is the one that heals itself through uh, the use of your your antibodies and your and your my, my macrophages so that basically clean out your your disease. Your immune system is the one that is critical for any healing to take place. So if we make sure that our immune system is strengthened through the use of uh, medicinal herbs, which are good immune boosters, which have a lot of vitamins, which have a lot of antioxidants. Obviously, when we start putting all of that in our body, in our system, we, we, we tend to live a better life. 
Uh, another thing uh, which I've also covered, the issue of uh, documentation. Uh, that is very important. Uh, are we documenting enough in terms of the medicinal plants to use? Are we documenting enough in terms of what uh, dosages to use? Are we documenting enough in terms of uh, the combination, because when you go to traditional health practitioners or you go to herbalist, in most cases, you're going to get more than one or two herbs that you are given to use, and you're also given certain uh, uh, rules in terms of how to administer them. You take one in the morning, or you take two, or you mix the two in the morning, or you, all of those things. Is it well documented? If I go to KZN uh, for the same plant, will I be given the same uh, instruction if I go to Northwest or if I go to the Free State or if I go to Venda. So all of that information, I think, is also something that we also need to make sure that we, 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 we document well uh, so we know exactly uh, what we have at our arsenal. It becomes much easier for us to convince the nation that let's try this because we know for sure that it has been tried and tested for many years. It doesn't have to be tried and tested in the hospital, but if we have traditional health practitioners and their associations having all of this information documented, verified, then it's something that becomes easy for us to, uh, to, to start promoting, uh, to promote in terms of the plan, to, to improve, and then also for researchers to come on board, to come and also assist in terms of supporting all the, the, the information that is required. So scientists, all they do, they don't invent plants, they don't invent the bioactive compounds inside there. All they do, they just say, analyze what bioactive compounds are there, they document them, they tell you that if you plant this plant uh, in this uh, province uh, and you another one plants it in, in KZN, do they come out the same in terms of the constituents that they have or are they different? That's what science is all about. And then obviously when they test them, then they'll tell you if the effect is more or less the same. So it's very important that when the scientists come, there was already uh, documentation that is uh, that is there uh, from the knowledge holders, the IKS holders, and then once the scientists come, they just uh, basically feed into that and support the information, so people can have more confidence in applying those uh, uh, or using uh, those medicines. So it's also another thing which I feel uh, we as Africans, as we start celebrating and embracing our culture, we need to always uh, have that uh, in our thing at our arsenal. Uh, because we cannot just take, uh, especially COVID came in as a, as a classical example where everyone is getting infected everywhere. So we cannot use the whole country as guinea pigs and say, oh, by the way, I just discovered a plant in my backyard, drink it, and then you, you get better. Uh, for, uh, for the government to take us on board or to embrace whatever products we have, obviously we need to have something that is well documented. Again, it then becomes the issue of trust. It becomes the issue of trust between the different stakeholders, between the scientists, between the traditional health practitioners, between the government, because all this knowledge, how then do you protect it? How do you make sure that everyone benefits? How do you make sure that no one takes in this information and then goes sell it to the highest bidder and then run away with all the proceeds? So again, it's something that we also need to start having this engagement as Africans. Uh, it's something that, uh, due to the colonial past that we had, due to the uh, legacy that we have, unfortunately, it was put uh, not even under the carpet. It was basically dug uh, six feet underground as if it does not, doesn't exist. So now we're trying to resuscitate it, we're trying to re-embrace it, we're trying to uh, bring it uh, its importance uh, to, for everyone to know and, and understand. So it's important that when we're doing that process, difficult as it is, we were transparent with one another, we trust one another, and we work uh, well with each other in terms of the documentation, in terms of the, the research that is required, and also in terms of the, 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 the guidelines, because also we need to have our own guidelines, our own formulations. We need to propose our own guidelines as Africans. If we want to use traditional medicines, how, what is our measure of safety? What is our measure of success? What is our measure of uh, to tolerance? All of those things, we need to also come up with them. Because right now, if you want to use our own traditional medicines using the Western style, it will not work. Uh, it will not work. It will always have a lot of uh, challenges because the Western world, whether they make drugs, 
they make one single compound and then they test it. They test for its effect, effect, effectiveness. They take test for its safety. And then from there they said, okay, if I drink this, do I get better or do I get poisoned? If you get better, then okay, the benefits outweigh the, the negatives, then they can approve it and then you can go buy it in the shelf. Traditional medicines, on the other hand, you go, you get a plant, then you grind into fine powder, and then you can drink it as a concoction. Within that concoction, you can have multiple um, compounds, some of them active, some of them are just uh, nutrients, some of them are just uh, vitamins, some of them are just antioxidants. So our concoction of me traditional medicines they will be obviously consisting of a, a wide range of chemicals, which obviously, if you want to test them individually, it will take the whole process uh, to get them approved according to the Western standard. So it's also critical and important for us as South Africans and as Africans to come up with our own standards, our own standards of, 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 of validating our medicines, our own standards of testing our medicines, our own standards of checking the effect, uh, effect, effectiveness and, and also the safety. So obviously once we have that, it should be applicable throughout. So in KZN and you think in the Northwest, in the Free State, Western Cape, Northern Cape, Lipopo, um, Pumalanga, anywhere, it should be common and uniform. So that again, the issue of us working together and also speaking on the same voice becomes very critical and very important. So that's another thing we, we also need to work on when we embrace our heritage, we embrace being African and embrace our uh, knowledge systems that we have, that we've inherited, that we also want to preserve so our future generations can also uh, inherit. Uh, another issue which I feel we, we, we need to do, especially us as universities, uh, we need to start promoting the curriculum. Uh, we need to promote uh, training of new minds or new generations of scientists who can start embracing this. Uh, if you go to most of the curriculum, especially in the sciences, everything is still based on the Western approach. It's based on, okay, one compound, one target. Uh, then look for whether it's safe or is it active, uh, toxic or not, all of those things. So we need to also start thinking, what curriculum can we bring on board uh, for us as Africans to embrace our, 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 our traditional medicines? And then how can we then treat, I mean, teach our doctors to administer those? Because right now, Doctors will never write you a prescription of a traditional medicines because they have never been taught to work with those kind of uh, formulations. So how then do we teach, teach our pharmacists to actually start working on those uh, formulations and prescriptions? So again, it's also important for us to, uh, to change our curriculum and improve it to make sure that uh, when we take this further and want to promote it, we have all the the, the, the systems in place, the education system must be in place, the government policies must be in place, the research must be in place, uh, the, the, the traditional health practitioners and, the, and the, the, the communities, the marketing, everything that is required here, we need to educate ourselves. No one is going to come from elsewhere to teach us how to do our things if we want to take it forward. So that's a thing which you also need to uh, play a role and I'm happy that our university is playing uh, a leading role in this uh, sphere where we, we are promoting research in this area, but there's still a lot of things that we can improve. Uh, right now, we have a lot of passionate scientists and researchers who have been working with a number of traditional health practitioners, trying to work with their medicines and trying to uh, give some scientific uh, backing around it, not to say that uh, it, it just to prove that it works, but just to support scientifically that it's working. So the university is doing that, but we need to train more students. Uh, unfortunately, most of our curriculum does not teach anything about traditional medicine. So it's high time us as colleagues try to des uh, design some uh, curriculums either in the first year or in the second year or in the third year or at honors level where we start uh, bringing up uh, all of these ideas into our young minds so they can also uh, get more interest on it. I'm sure about 80 to 90% of our students where they come from, they know of one or two traditional health practitioner, one or two herbalist who they can think of uh, in terms of what they do to the community. So it's something that if they come with that, if they have that knowledge, we teach them how to engage with them, we teach them how to uh, uh, help other traditional health practitioners or IKS holders 
in terms of preserving the knowledge, in terms of documenting the knowledge, in terms of uh, mixing and preparing and testing, all of those things. If we start having it as part of our curriculum, I think as uh, Africans, as South Africans, will go a long way uh, in making sure that uh, indeed uh, our, our heritage and our culture is, is, is preserved. Uh, so that's uh, in a nutshell what uh, I wanted to uh, highlight in terms of uh, what our traditional medicines are and what where we are uh, as a country. Uh, there's a lot we can learn from from other uh, countries. Uh, for instance, if we go to the Asian countries, uh, especially your China, your, uh, your Korea, your India, they, they have been embracing this for, for a long time. Uh, there, there are dedicated hospitals where patients go there and actually everything is ad that is administered is traditional medicines that have been passed on from generation to generation, some as early as three to 4,000 years ago. So they have embraced that. It's something that is doable. It's not something that we just have to uh, think as a pipe dream or something, but it needs all the effort. In China, we have pharmacies that they will go and only to administer or prescribe only traditional medicines. Uh, you have universities that teach doctors on how to administer and treat patients using traditional medicines. So it's something that we can learn from other countries and try and see how best can we uh, import it here. Not necessarily that copy everything that is uh, being done by the Chinese. We also need to embrace our own Africanism and make it our own African way, but it doesn't uh, mean that we cannot learn. Uh, we cannot learn how to formulate policies. We cannot learn how to set up uh, curriculum structures. We cannot learn how to set up infrastructure. We can learn that and then see how can we best uh, Africanize it. So it's something that, yes, we, we, we can do. We can do it. It needs a lot of effort. Uh, it needs a lot of passion. It needs a lot of dedication. Uh, but it's something that we as Africans can definitely do it uh, and, uh, and, and embrace our culture. Uh, I just want to highlight a little bit. Uh, of course, I was saying that uh, we have there's a lot of gaps that I was highlight. Uh, I was mainly talking about, but there are some positives which uh, one can take out uh, uh, that people have done here in the country, and we should also uh, embrace those and also uh, commend those uh, institutions that have, uh, have done that, and also hopefully we can get more around the country doing that, and then also the more we have then obviously the more much easier it is to, to get our systems in order and, and up and running. I know, for, for, for instance, uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Shawapo from the Innet Health, uh, it's an association of a uh, network of African traditional and natural product medicines health champions, uh, which are made up of mainly traditional health practitioners, most of them mainly concentrated in the, the Val area, the City Bank area, but they also have collaborators from Lesotho and also in the Free State province. They have been at the forefront of this. Since the COVID came out, they were not sitting down and crying that government is shutting them down. They, they tried to organize themselves and say, okay, how best can we, uh, I think, support the healthcare system in terms of uh, making sure that our people don't die, our people are not uh, affected or or left to suffer while we can assist. So those are the kind of things that we need, those kind of traditional health practitioners, associations, making the initiative to say, government, we are available to help, although you might not trust us, although you might not trust our, uh, our, our products, but give us a chance. And they've done it, they've invited government health uh, care officials, they've also did, uh, designed a number of uh, screening protocols where patients come and they, they do some triage to check whether this person uh, what kind of symptoms are they presenting? So those are kind of things that we need where we don't have to be isolated from one another where we say no, only this way or no way at all. So it's something that we need this kind of uh, uh, organizations to come on board uh, to, to also promote our heritage and our culture uh, in, in a more professional where people will feel comfortable, where you go to consult from the traditional health practitioners, they check your, your, your temperature, they take your blood pressure, they check your, your, your heart rate, all of those things. We, we start training our traditional health practitioners to also uh, be, be, think, uh, be able to perform those kind of, uh, of, of basic testing. So it's something that we, we as Africans need to start embracing also, uh, because obviously 
as the world evolves, people want proof, people want to see uh, life uh, evidence of, 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 of things that are changing. So we can't just always talk about uh, uh, throwing the bones to say, you know, things are going to get better. We should also show them the, the proper uh, screenings that they would expect to get if they were to go to uh, a, a private hospital or to a clinic, a government hospital, where they will get all these uh, test uh, machines being put around them. So again, it's something that we need to start embracing uh, as uh, health, traditional healthcare practitioners, obviously working in support with uh, other, uh, other uh, institutions. I know the, the Inet Health, uh, they're working together with uh, uh, supporting by value investor of technology. So the researchers there who are also assisting them to validate the products and also to make sure that things are done properly. Uh, Dr. Ramokono Piano is the one who's leading this uh, unit and also working very, very well on this. Uh, we also know uh, there's a rough match, which uh, I've seen a lot in the media. They have a lot of products that they've been uh, pro uh, the promoting uh, and selling to people within the country. And then this other time I was seeing a clip where they're saying that they've sold to people in the US, they've sold to people in uh, Australia, uh, in Europe. Uh, just basically me medicines that they use, uh, uh, people can drink. Uh, and then people have testified that after taking those uh, products, the, se the severe symptoms that they were experiencing from COVID just disappeared, or they never experienced any COVID symptoms at all. So again, it's something that if we have something and we believe in it, let's also push it. Uh, let's not wait for someone to come and say, all right, I'll work with you to, uh, to make it, to make it uh, uh, commercialized and therefore that uh, make it uh, available to everyone. If you have something and you have strong passion on it and you have a team around you that believes in the same vision, let's work on it and let's promote that. Because the more we promote that, the more we, we, we show the world that our products are working as developed by us as Africans using our own way methods of developing and using our own ways of administering it then obviously people will start thinking that, okay, not everyone is crazy that is going there and getting help. So maybe I can also go and get assisted there. So unfortunately, at this point, we, we need to have more of that uh, to, to start pushing our message and hopefully one day things will get better. Uh, also from the government, the government has also been uh, uh, supportive of this. Uh, the Department of Science and Innovation has established now uh, uh, a consortium of researchers uh, under the the, you know, the 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 theme of indigenous knowledge uh, based research uh, where researchers from universities are across the country focusing on traditional medicines are recognized and are also brought under one one roof where they can share ideas of how best can we do this research going forward uh, with respect to covid uh, there's about seven products that are actually being currently investigated for uh, as alternative treatment to COVID. There's one that is being championed by the investor of free state, working together with a uh, university in Beijing, where they found preliminary results that indeed uh, these uh, plants are, are, are able to, to, to treat uh, COVID. And it's going to hopefully very soon go for clinical trials where hopefully it can also be now recommended to, to serve as, a, as, a, as an alternative treatment. So not everything has to be a trick, uh, at a pill that you get from the pharmacy, but you can also make use of this uh, in this technology. So this, obviously these plants are plants that were known for a very long time, from, generation, from many generations ago. It's something that we, we, science has come on board to say we can support this, and now there's some progress around it. And also another one, uh, UKZN also is also working in collaboration with the university in uh, USA and Canada. They're also working on a separate plant, which also has been found to be actually uh, active against uh, COVID. And again, more work is being done on it. CSIR and University of Pretoria are also working uh, in this area here. So we do have uh, researchers within the country that are, are working on COVID and also other plants to try and uh, put the science around it and also make it, uh, make it uh, uh, fashionable, if one may call it that way. So it's something that, yes, as a country, we, we still have our challenges, but the government is, is supporting us and we do have researchers 
in addition to us as UN working here, uh, working uh, with uh, traditional health practitioners to promote uh, the safety of profile of the medicines and also to show that indeed those uh, medicines are very effective and are very active. Uh, also, which is something which uh, maybe I can just make use as a, some sort of a, a marketing tool, uh, the World Health Organization, the Africa region, uh, the Africa division of it, uh, they're in the process of declaring four South African universities as centers of excellence in uh, traditional medicines. Uh, so fortunate enough, you University of Limpopo has also been considered along with the University of Free State, University of Kazun Natal and Walter Sisulu University. So hopefully as a university will also grow our capacity to work more with uh, other traditional health practitioners and other IKS holders and other community members who want to promote the use of traditional medicines, not only for COVID, but for all diseases that and other pandemics that may arise. So it's all about us being uh, prepared. It's all about us being uh, equipped. Uh, it's all about us having our systems in, in, in place, having make, making sure that we, we are able to document our, our knowledge. We are able to have systems where we can reproduce it in terms of research, in terms of uh, training, in terms of uh, teaching future generations. That is also very important. And also we need to make sure that we, we have a system that makes sure that there is standardization where everything that we do, we do as Africans speaks in one voice. So it's no point for us to have different systems for different provinces or for different organizations, because then that will just cause divisions. And if we all want to go and ask the government to support uh, this uh, uh, the use of traditional medicines on a uh, national scale, where if I go to a hospital, and I want to be given uh, only treated by traditional medicines. There should be a standardized uh, way of registering the compounds, which should be the same in every hospital, not just uh, some places having uh, effective doses and the other ones being non-effective. So with that said, uh, the program director and uh, DVC, I was just want to say uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I uh, thank you to all who participated. And I just hope that uh, it will be something that can stimulate our thinking and also help us uh, embrace who we are, uh, not to look down on our heritage, not to look down on our heart culture, not to look down on our traditional medicines and our IKS holders in the form of herbalists, in the form of traditional health practitioners, because the products that they have the information that they have, the knowledge that they have is useful, is very important, and science does need it. And we'll do our level best as the university to support them. We'll do our level best as uh, researchers to support and hopefully make you make this uh, uh, the, 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 the use and the acknowledgement of traditional medicines uh, to be preserved for more generations to come. So with, with all those and I've just said now, uh, having said those few words, uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Professor Winston Malo, thank you very much. What a wonderful, informative presentation. Not only giving us all Pesa University on our indigenous medicinal plants research and uh, African traditional healing, but uh, we also know that uh, Professor Ngumalo has also traveled these countries that he's mentioning. He has been in these hospitals where they, they practice traditional medicine formally. And he, he comes from a background where he talks about what he has experienced. And you can tell from his presentation that he has touched base, he has physically touched base with these researchers. He has been in these kind of settings. What a setting that he has set for the country to be the involvement that they are trying to achieve in comparison with the rest of the other indigenous countries that are embracing their indigenous cultures and heritage in terms of healing and providing the fauna and flora of their respective environments to provide answers that are thorny, especially now with the COVID pandemic, how African traditional medicine can be used to provide some of the answers and some of the medications other than the conventional uh, Western medicines. Thank you, Professor Numaru, what a wonderful presentation. And um, 
To close off, we take you back to Ghana where Tom Colvin composes a song, Fill Us With Your Love, talking about the scenario where Jesus Christ was saving the Last Supper with the disciples who he knows moments later, they will desert him. They would not necessarily love him. When the tough times come, Peter will deny him three times. And the rest of the people, some of them will betray him. Some of them will run away when the tough time comes. And he says to the rest of Africa, your neighbors can be rich and poor. Neighbors can be black or white. We are all African. We are all united. Let's celebrate our African heritage. Fill us with your love by Tom Colvin. Fill us with your love, show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Kneel at the feet of his friends, silently washes their feet. Master who acts as Neighbors are rich and poor. Neighbors are.